welcome to all of you from the International Energy Agency headquarters here in Paris. Uh, I'm seeing colleagues are joining. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here this afternoon. I'm really delighted. I'm Laura Cozzi, the Director for Sustainability Technology and Outlooks. And what you're doing uh, this afternoon is uh, the launch of the uh, 2024 edition uh, of the World uh, Employment Re Report, uh, but not only that, um, I'm really delighted that we are uh, joined by uh, five very distinguished speakers um, from different parts of the energy uh, sector, from governance, company, trade unions, social media platforms, to discuss the findings and how to move ahead uh, just transitions. So uh, we have with us today Corey Anderson from Natural Resources Canada. Welcome to Corey again, she joined us last year too. Archana Patankar from India's National Skill Development Corporation. Elisabetta Kolakia from Enel Group. Uh, Eric Manzi from the um, International Trade Union Confederation. And finally, Ephraim Beiser from LinkedIn. I believe some of those colleagues are joining us from Baku. So very many thanks for taking the time to join us. And I know for some of you, it's either very early in the morning or late uh, in the afternoon. So. Um, before passing the floor to uh, Dan Wetzel, who's been uh, managing and is the uh, lead author of uh, uh, this report, let me give you a couple of uh, uh, what I think are the key findings and uh, uh, the, the important takeaways from my point of view uh, from, uh, from this report. Uh, let me start saying that um, uh, I actually decided to start looking into this issue three years ago as um, uh, uh, at the IEA we look at uh, all uh, energies uh, and really uh, it was not possible to find a comprehensive data set globally that was tracking for each part of the uh, energy sector for each country how the lifeblood of the energy system our workers were evolving over time so we started this journey three years ago and finally uh, we are very pleased with this uh, uh, comprehensive data sets that we provide to you for free uh, on our website uh, with all the analysis uh, around it. And I'm very pleased that this year, our first finding is that uh, uh, employment in the energy sector last year outperformed the global economy, meaning it grew more quickly than uh, the job force in the global economy. So last year alone, uh, the global energy workforce grew by around 2.5 million people so that we uh, currently have nearly 70 million workers in energy, with the workers in clean energy being around 37 million uh, and the remainder uh, working in fossil fuels and related industries. So which sectors grew uh, the most? Uh, we see actually solar PV growing very strongly, uh, EVs uh, growing very strongly. And a key driver for this uh, job growth has been the tremendous expansion of uh, manufacturing, uh, a topic that we have analyzed uh, in details in the latest energy technology perspective uh, that our uh, ETP team released at the end of uh, October. Uh, not only clean energy grew, but also uh, fossil fuels, in particular jobs in oil and gas. After a few years of uncertainty, uh, we have seen last year 600,000 new jobs being created in uh, oil and gas sector, uh, while we are seeing a different trend confirming, in a way, uh, a um, structural de decline for coal workers, mostly due to uh, continued uh, improvements in mining productivity gains. So overall, uh, I would say it's a very uh, positive picture, one in which um, investment in energy are uh, really uh, having a thriving workforce. However, we shouldn't be uh, taken aside uh, from some of the existing and, em and emerging challenges um, that the global um, picture gives. In particular, I would like to uh, stress uh, three of them. First of all, the geographical distribution of uh, these workers is pretty uneven, in particular when we look at uh, uh, clean energy jobs. Clean energy jobs that were supposed to be less resource dependent uh, are actually uh, equally concentrated. In particular, uh, we are seeing this concentration happening in advanced economies in China, uh, where uh, we see if you look outside those geographies, uh, home uh, of uh, uh, nearly 60% of the global 
uh, workforce, emerging markets and developing economies have only seen a quarter of the growth in clean energy since 2019. Um, this is something that has been highlighted uh, from many representatives of our Clean Energy Labor Council that are concerning uh, voices that countries in emerging and developing economies are not benefiting from the clean energy boom, while at the same time, in some circumstances, are experiencing lo job losses if coal mines are closed, uh, fossil fuel power plants are, uh, are shut down. So uh, this is very clearly, uh, first and foremost, uh, one area that we are looking at very uh, closely, the geographical distribution, uh, as it is very much at the center of uh, people center transition element that we are looking at very closely at the IEA. The second is uh, uh, shortages, jobs shortages. We have been um, doing a survey of over 190 uh, employers around uh, nearly 30 countries, and uh, the respondents are very clearly 75% saying that they are struggling to fill positions, in particular in social sectors related to constructions. Uh, so that we are seeing very clearly, for example, in grids, in nuclear power plants, that the global workforce is in a way slowing down the transition and not materializing really the hope of uh, new jobs that we were, uh, that we were uh, hoping. So uh, we will discuss later what can be done. And I think there are uh, very many, very good examples that we can uh, bring forward. And the third is about skills. We are actually seeing the, the update of new technologies really reshaping the energy sector and in particular clean energy. Uh, for example, grid inspection work being carried out by drones, uh, mechanized mining techniques that are improving safety, but also requiring different, uh, uh, different skills. And in, in general, AI uh, and other changes in the digital landscape that are requiring different skills. Now, this reskilling and upskilling is not necessarily keeping pace with, with the needs of the uh, of, of the energy sector. So here we see in the picture in the globally uh, a very good one. Some areas that require attention, and uh, I'm really delighted that all of the colleagues that we have around the table from Canada that has been leading on the uh, just energy transition, examples from India that is one of the uh, bright spotlight in uh, in the emerging uh, economies, uh, lessons from the International Trade Union of Confederation, and finally from uh, NL and LinkedIn, really the analysis of uh, the skills and uh, green jobs to really have a discussion about solutions uh, going forward. Now, uh, I leave the floor now uh, to Dan Wetzel, who has been leading this report. Um, just uh, one final word, uh, thanking not only all of the speakers of today, but also uh, some of the uh, companies and countries that have been really helping us uh, taking forward this work, including the US Department of State and LA Foundation. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lara. Um, and as Lara said, I think the first news that we want to open up with is that energy jobs continue to rise and this is outpacing what we're seeing elsewhere in the economy. So this is true both for clean energy and fossil fuels outpacing the economy-wide growth of 2.2%. So what we see here is clean energy around 4.6% growth last year and fossil fuels uh, nearing 3%. Now, this has been a pretty robust growth ever since uh, energy employment took a hit in 2020 due to the pandemic, um, where fossil fuels in particular uh, saw a series of layoffs. But since then, we've seen pretty robust growth in both sectors with clean energy outpacing that of fossil fuels, um, surpassing them in 2021. Now, when we look out to 2024, um, we see a, a slight uh, slowdown in the growth pace of energy employment. Um, from moving from 3.8% this year to around 3% for 2024 based on initial data. Now, part of this reflects uh, a changing uh, and evolving energy context um, in which in our latest world energy outlook that was released last month, we see by the end of this decade, ample supplies of oil and LNG, as well as clean energy technology manufacturing capacity, putting downward pressure on prices and increased competition uh, amongst different suppliers. So how we're seeing the energy uh, industry respond from a hiring perspective reflects their relative positioning to how they're perceiving this future. So um, what we're seeing is clean energy uh, firms are typically taking a more bullish approach to hiring um, and positioning themselves for future growth, where fossil fuels have been a bit more cautious, but still at the same time, we expect to see 2024, uh, by the end of the year, a return of fossil fuel employment to levels from prior to the pandemic. 
When we then turn to look at the key drivers of this growth on a subsector basis, we see that this is split between clean and fossil sectors. So as Laura said, oil and gas supply uh, added around 600,000 jobs uh, last year. Um, and this was on the back of a rapid expansion of new LNG infrastructure, as well as also new production coming online in the Americas and the Middle East. Solar PV saw another record year of installations um, with almost uh, half a million jobs added largely in the construction sector. And then when we turn to vehicle manufacturing, we actually see that uh, vehicle sales have returned near two levels uh, prior to the pandemic just this year. And we see this growth split pretty evenly between the manufacture of internal combustion engine vehicles, as well as also electric vehicles and their batteries. Um, and this is amidst uh, sort of a broader uh, challenge that this industry is facing in terms of rising costs, increased global competition, and uh, relative positioning where many companies are trying to find where they want to position themselves as uh, the industry increasingly shifts to electric vehicles, hybrids, and efficient vehicles. Now, looking elsewhere, there was still growth, but this growth was a little bit more complicated um, for some of the reasons that Lara highlighted. If we take wind, for example, we see that uh, wind jobs grew on a global basis thanks to uh, a record number of projects entering construction this year. But at the same time, there was a series of notable layoffs from uh, equipment manufacturers in the wind sector. Um, and this was largely a result of uh, a decreased forward pipeline of projects, rising costs, and this was really uh, acutely felt in the offshore sector. When we also look to grids and nuclear, we see that uh, a skills gap um, was already leading to the delays of several projects um, and the constraining the ability for these two industries to take on more work. Um, and so this is something we already heralded in our last year's world energy employment, the, the real risk of labor and skills bottlenecks um, becoming a, a drag on the pace of clean energy installation. So one thing that is not uh, pictured in this graph um, is that while most sectors of the energy uh, industry saw growth, coal was a notable exception. And we saw, as Lara said, a structural decline in coal employment globally. Um, it's been down around 1% for the last four years, pretty consecutively. Um, and this is largely driven by productivity gains. And I think one striking number that came out from this analysis was even just in the last four years, the number of workers required to produce a ton of coal decreased by 13%, largely due to mechanization um, and progress in China and other Asian markets. Now, when looking to the source of this growth uh, on a regional basis, we see some pretty marked trends. So China um, added the most jobs largely concentrated in clean energy sectors. Now, part of this is just owing to the size and scale of China as a country and its labor force. But China, because of its surge forward, particularly on clean energy manufacturing, um, has seen the number of jobs per capita in the energy sector rise to around 14 uh, jobs per 1,000 people. Um, this is a similar level that we currently see today in the Middle East and North America. Um, so for a sense of comparison, when we look to Europe, that number is around 10 per 1,000. Latin America is at eight, India at six, and Africa around three. So really this push forward is making China a, a disproportionately large energy player um, like other regions like North America and Middle East have been in the past. Now, when we look at advanced economies on an actual percent basis for the surge forward in clean energy, um, they actually grew at a faster pace than China last year in the manufacturing sector, aided by new policy momentum. But when we look to other emerging market and developing economies outside of China, uh, we see more concentration in a few places, notably oil and gas and internal combustion engine manufacturing uh, or vehicle manufacturing. Um, additionally, when we look at where these jobs were concentrated, these were highly concentrated in uh, India, which out of the 25% of new jobs in clean sectors added uh, in emerging market and developing economies, India accounted for over half of those. Um, the one thing that we did see in particular was that the concentration in oil and gas supply and other extractive industries and raw materials tends to be also true for sectors like critical minerals and bioenergy in which emerging market and developing economies have found a strong foothold uh, in these sectors as well and make up around 80% of the growth in uh, this raw materials segment of the value chain for energy. 
Another key trend that hi Lara highlighted was the pivot and the significance of the clean energy manufacturing boom to job growth last year. So historically, construction has been the leading sector for new energy jobs in, in the clean sectors, um, with around a third of clean energy jobs today being in construction. And so this is the trend you're seeing here for the last uh, three years. The pivot this year was quite marked in that manufacturing jobs ticked up by 40% while construction actually fell from that three-year previous average. The reasons for this on the manufacturing side was, uh, according to our Energy Technology Perspectives report, we saw a record level of investment in new clean energy manufacturing facilities up 50%. Um, and then on the construction side, we actually are seeing these uh, skilled labor shortages actually starting to really bite and constrain the growth of hiring compared to what firms wanted to have. In that same survey that Lara mentioned, uh, she said that three quarters of uh, those report respondents had reported difficulty in hiring positions, and this number held for both manufacturing and construction. But when we look and try and, uh, and look at those who highlighted these as acute and very difficult uh, hiring constraints, um, we saw that these were four times higher in construction positions than they were in manufacturing. And this is also having, uh, it's being played out in what we're seeing in trends on wages as well. Um, when looking at occupations with an energy specialization, we saw many of those wages rise by up to 9% across many geographies last year, where the similar occupations uh, in elsewhere in the economy and these more generic occupations only saw wages rise around 6%. This is reflecting in many ways the strategies that many firms are taking to raise pay to attract the needed talent. Um, and this is particularly acute for highly skilled energy technicians, where looking across 70 countries where we had wage data, we saw that these skilled positions, uh, these, these highly skilled positions in energy technicians, 90% of those geographies saw them outpace the growth for other similar occupations elsewhere. This reflects several things, both the need to attract more talent, but also a higher ability to pay in some cases for energy sectors to uh, attract workers away from other parts of the economy. And this is an area to watch um, as this could uh, exacerbate existing constraints in wider labor markets uh, in, in the broader economy. Now, the Good news on this is obviously, even though we had some of these uh, constraints in finding the skilled labor, companies are finding workarounds and finding ways to be able to hire the talent they need and oftentimes training them on the job. So on the job training is really the first port of call for many companies. And this is particularly true for any manufacturing facility or company where you have a strong centralized presence um, where you're able to train those workers on site for the specific needs that they have. And oftentimes that allows these companies to still hire, even if sacrificing on the desired uh, qualifications that they were looking for in the postings. Now, when we look at more decentralized sectors like construction, where you really rely on workers to have these certifications and qualifications when applying to these positions, this is something where we saw um, more of these positions uh, needing to find a way to get the relevant qualifications to address these bottlenecks. Um, for a new analysis the IEA took on this year was looking at some of these transition pathways. You see three of them here, from plumber to heat pump technician, electrician to solar PV system designer, and electrician to high voltage electrician. Most of these upskilling or conversion trainings are quite short in the case of the uh, two that you see here. Um, and then on the far right and in other sectors, we did see these conversion trainings taking a little bit longer, um, but the shorter timeframes were around one to three months. Um, and we see some of these stretching to over two years for the more uh, complicated uh, and sort of uh, requiring higher levels of skills. Now, um, we do also see an opportunity that what you see here is actually a range. So many of the countries um, that had training specific for high voltage electricians saw those in the six month range. So there are opportunities to harmonize uh, and standardize some of these certifications to make sure we're meeting the pace and demand of industry for new talent. Now, this is only a patch if we do not address the underlying shortages in the broader labor pool for many of these vocational positions. Um, what we see is training a new plumber or electrician takes between two and five years in most countries. Um, and that this is compounded with the fact that many major economies are seeing the number of people going into these vocational degrees falling. Um, one case in point is China has seen these vocational, uh, new, new entries into vocational positions fall by 30% over the last decade. 
and with those with an energy specialization are down 60%. Um, when we are also looking to uh, address some of these trainings um, and providing this, uh, another key aspect here is conversion training often falls uh, on the individual to finance this. And so this is one area in which governments can intervene, providing support to make sure that the, uh, the upfront cost is not too difficult and be able to encourage many of them to make this switch because many of these uh, offer a very quick payback and higher wages on the other side. Um, I wanna jump back briefly to wages because um, beyond the fact that we see energy wages growing faster than other parts of the economy, we also see differences between different portions of the energy uh, sector. So what you see here is solar PV, which has uh, across different economies grew around 4% in wages. And then in other, for oil and gas across the same economies, usually rising around 2%. Uh, so this is generally true between clean energy, job, clean energy wages growing faster than that in fossil fuel sectors. So we could also do the same graph with coal, with wind and others as well. Um, what we're seeing in, in this is uh, partially a greater ability to pay and also um, the reflection of where these different sectors are drawing talent from. Um, one thing that is not shown here is that oil and gas, for instance, is already one of the highest paid sectors in the energy space today alongside nuclear where solar PV, wind and coal uh, see lower wages on average. So when we think about transition pathways and many companies that we surveyed highlighted that they prefer to hire workers from within the energy sector before turning elsewhere, that this prevailing wage difference could be a headwind to be able to have that internal transfer within the energy sector. Lastly, I want to leave you with just uh, one picture about the significance of energy job growth to the broader economy. Um, what we're seeing is around 3% of uh, in global employment is in the energy sector today, as we've defined it. When looking at these sectors, they are a much higher percentage of growth with clean really leading the way. Last year, we saw China around 10% of their job growth was from these clean energy sectors and with many advanced economies hovering around this 4% of growth. Now, when we turn our attention to other emerging market and developing economies, we see most of them under 2% of the overall economy-wide job growth is coming from clean energy sectors. This prompted a, a pretty big deep dive in the question of how these countries can better position themselves going forward to attract some of these new jobs, attract this investment, um, and how they can overcome some of the structural challenges that makes this uh, difficult in terms of skills, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of policy settings. Um, so I think we're very privileged today to be joined uh, by many people who are uh, deeply versed in the different tactics countries are taking to upskill their uh, domestic workforce, helping ensure a just transition and an equitable transition, and ensuring the clean energy transition uh, is a global one and not uh, disproportion disproportionately concentrated in certain parts of the world. So with that, I'll hand this back to Lara to uh, have that discussion and hear from our experts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dan, for this uh, uh, excellent, excellent presentation and overview of our uh, of our findings. Um, if uh, uh, Corey allows me, I will uh, like to give her the floor. Uh, Corey is the director for Sustainability, Sustainable Jobs and Natural Resources uh, uh, Canada. Uh, Corey joined us last year too. Um, and uh, I, I may remind all our uh, audience today that Canada is really leading uh, uh, on just transitions domestically and internationally. So we look forward to hearing from you, Corey. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lara. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. It's great to be back again uh, for a second year. Um, and just uh, as, as we were going through the presentation, I'm seeing so many similarities um, with my domestic context, both in terms of opportunities and challenges. Um, so I guess that's reassuring to know that um, many different jurisdictions are, are facing the same challenges uh, as Canada is. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really pleased that the IEA is focusing on this uh, important element of the clean energy transition. 
I think we all know there's no net zero future without a skilled workforce to build it. And, and this report is really um, drawing that out. Uh, we're hearing every day um, from uh, net zero sectors in Canada, how critical it will be to have a workforce that is the right size and has the right skills and how important it is to support workers and communities to be economically successful in the transition. Um, this is really key to ensuring that as we go through the transition, that we bring our citizens along with us and that we have that social buy-in and support. And data is really key to conveying the scope of the opportunities that are available to us as we make that transition to net zero. Um, and those are significant. Uh, for example, in Canada, an organization called Clean Energy Canada is projecting that the number of jobs in Canada's clean energy sector will grow 3.4% annually over the next decade. And for us, that's four times faster than our national average. So this really is a sector that is growing quickly um, and that we need to support with, uh, with the right workforce. Uh, we had a big year in 2024 in Canada advancing our sustainable jobs approach and that is our domestic initiative that has come out of our international just transition commitments and it's focused on fostering the shift to low carbon economic growth while supporting workers and communities to thrive in our net zero economy. Um, so we passed sustainable jobs legislation this June, which among other things includes a requirement for the federal government to produce an action plan every five years. Uh, so we're now working on our first plan, which will be released next year. And this is really a transparency and accountability measure. It allows uh, Canadians to hold the government publicly accountable for delivering the responsive and relevant policies and programs that are needed to support the creation of sustainable jobs. Um, and data is critical to this work. It's, it's really important for us to have up-to-date and accurate data collection, tracking, and analysis to guide our efforts to support future labor market conditions effectively. Uh, it helps to inform our policy efforts aimed at advancing opportunities, especially for those who've been traditionally um, underrepresented in our labor market, uh, especially in the energy and resource sectors. And here I'm referring to women, to indigenous peoples, uh, racialized peoples, people living with disabilities, and the 2SLGBTQI plus community. Um, and that's why we're closely following research like this World Energy Employment Report. Um, it really does confirm that many of the things that we're seeing uh, are also being experienced around the world. And these types of reports are really important um, for the signals that they send to energy sectors, to investors, to workers, uh, to all of us around this virtual table and well beyond who are committed to advancing net zero. Um, so we really appreciate the work of the IEA and moving our collective understanding forward. Um, and, you know, as we grapple with things like skill shortages, um, the shortage in the trades and the need to upskill and reskill workers, uh, we're really interested to hear what other countries are doing, how other countries are, are tackling these challenges. Um, and uh, I think many of these issues uh, are, are also going to be um, discussed by my co-panelists. So I look forward to hearing from them. Thanks. Thank you very much, Corey. And I, I, I will uh, maybe uh, remind colleagues that Canada is leading the G7 next year, and we certainly are expecting that Canada will put uh, uh, at the center of the international efforts uh, uh, just transitions. So um, it's going to be another key moment to uh, to make this uh, um, a, a really prominent uh, uh, topic in the international uh, agenda. Um, with this, I would really like to invite uh, Archana to, to join us. Uh, so Archana is the Vice President of Research and Impact at the National Skills Development Corporation in uh, India. And um, uh, we've been working very closely. We had India as a special focus in in the World Energy Employment Report. And many thanks for all the support and the exchanges. And uh, Archana, I think that uh, uh, colleagues that are following us from uh, the uh, emerging countries and developing economies want to hear what are you doing right? Because uh, you're really coming out as one of the bright stories. So I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Firstly, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this webinar. And also congratulations on a wonderful, a very informative report on the World Energy Employment Outlook. And of course, giving us the pride of place in that report as a country. Um, so as we know, India 
is posting a very high GDP growth. We actually stand as one of the world's fastest growing major economies. Uh, we have a very broad energy landscape. So we not only have huge investments currently going into conventional sources like coal and natural gas, but there is equal importance or possibly more importance being given by government of India to renewable sources and their exploration, particularly solar and wind. As you know, India is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2070, for which many policies have been initiated to diversify and decarbonize our energy sources. So we see massive investments going into energy sector, particularly the solar and wind power plants, um, bolstered by uh, the Government of India scheme, which was launched in 2020, which is called Production-Linked Incentive Scheme, which is aimed at developing domestic manufacturing for solar modules, batteries, other clean energy equipments. Um, this transition to our energy and energy efficiency programs um, has seen a lot of major initiatives announced in recent years. So for instance, there is a scheme to promote small grid connected solar energy power plants, standalone solar powered agricultural pumps, solarization of existing grid connected agricultural pumps, bioenergy program, national green hydrogen mission, uh, launched recently. Um, of course, we as NSDC at National uh, National Skill Development Corporation know and are experiencing it that you know greening the energy sector is going to significantly impact the skilling landscape and the employment landscape in the country, and we really have to gear up for this. Um, now, this transformation is going to impact almost all segments, all stakeholders, right, right from exploration, mining, production, to manufacturing, retail, supply chains. And there is going to be huge demand for expertise, skilled labor, skilled workforce at all levels. So from technicians and engineers to uh, energy analysts, project managers, and in fact, even trans transport infrastructure supply chains. Um, National Skill Development Corporation is a nodal agency for the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship in India. Um, we pride ourselves as, uh, as being the principal um, architect for skill development in the country. And you know we play a very important role in facilitating this shift towards green energy sources. Um, so we do have structured skilling programs, collaboration with industries, and a great focus on green jobs. Um, so NSDC is very much supporting this transition where a renewable energy sector, as we know, is not only just driving energy sustainability, but it's also contributing to our economic growth and social equity. Um, so at NSDC, uh, if you look at our um, digital platform, which is the Skill India Digital Hub, you can see more than 70 skill training courses, which are both short term and little longer term courses, um, which are focused on green jobs. Thousands of candidates have enrolled for this already. And interestingly, 35% are also female candidates. So in all these jobs, especially the technician, et cetera, those jobs which were traditionally male dominated in the country, we see a great female participation, a gender perspective also coming in there. Um, we have sector skill councils representing, of course, different sectors, different industries. Uh, these are incubated by NSDC. I would like to mention two sector skill councils here. One is the sector skill council for green jobs. And um, the other is the automotive sector skill council or the automotive skill development council. These two sector skill councils are in particular contributing to the skilling landscape as far as the greening of the energy sector is concerned. Uh, so there are some wonderful initiatives which have been taken up by both sector skill councils in recent years. So for instance, there is a green skill development hub which was recently launched uh, in New Delhi, which is our capital. and this is a state-of-the-art facility for training in solar, wind, and green hydrogen. Uh, it has already equipped more than 1,200 professionals with the skills uh, required for the evolving energy landscape. There is a, an initiative called V-Power Initiative. It actually aims to break down barriers for women in the renewable energy sector. 
So this initiative organizes workshops, trainings, mentorship programs across all our major cities. Um, so we would like to cultivate a network of skilled women who are ready to lead and innovate in this industry, which of course, as I earlier mentioned, was traditionally male dominated. Um, we do have national green job pairs, you know, where we bring in participants, companies, uh, in the renewable energy, waste management, sustainable agriculture sort of businesses. Um, there are industry partnerships where there is a commitment to build a skilled workforce, bring in the required thousands of technicians required for the energy efficiency uh, business. Uh, we have a green entrepreneurship program as well, uh, which is aiming to skill women as leaders in the green business by providing seed funding, business training, network support, and so on. Uh, besides the core energy sector or the power sector, we have initiatives taken in the EV segment. Um, so as we know, uh, Government of India has set this ambitious target of 30% uh, electric vehicles on the roads by 2030, which is not too far away. And for this purpose, we of course need to skill more and more people and we need to help this transition from the conventional uh, to, to the uh, you know, EV segment. So there are cutting edge training programs which have been offered by the Automotive Skill Development Council. Uh, the council offers specialized training in electric vehicles, hybrid technology and, um, and you know, auto autonomous systems. Uh, so uh, we know that our automobile sector is a fast evolving sector and therefore the training needs are also changing rapidly. So we kind of have to keep pace with the industry demands. Um, we are offering these EV service technician training programs um, where candidates are given training, not just for technology, for maintenance, diagnostics, hands-on experience, like the on-the-job training with industry mentors is being offered to them. Besides skilling, there are a lot of reskilling and upskilling programs because the transition requires that uh, the workforce, which is traditionally employed in the conventional sector, will have to transition to the newer sectors. So we see huge demand coming for our reskilling and upskilling courses in future. Um, Thank you, Archana. If you, yeah. if you don't mind, I, I'm just yeah. mindful. I know the two colleagues uh, have to uh, rush to uh, another meeting. I'll, if you bear with us and you stay with us, maybe we'll come back to you on the reskilling sure. part after we heard from the others. Definitely. Thank you so much, Archana. I think your your skill counts is really fascinating, and I hope everyone will go and, uh, and, and look it up and take it as an example. So we have heard now from, uh, uh, from two governments uh, um, that who's doing the hiring is really private companies, so I turn uh, to um, Elisabetta Colacchia, who is uh, the head of people and uh, organization uh, at the Enel Group, uh, that can tell us uh, uh, how is she managing uh, the workforce. Thank you, for, thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel today. I truly appreciate the opportunity to discuss the latest insights from uh, the World Energy Employment Report. Such publication has become a crucial resource for leading companies in the energy sector, such as Enel. And given the importance of this report, the uh, Enel Foundation, for the third year in a row uh, since the inaugural edition back in 2022, has provided its support and the analytical contribution. Uh, in, um, in, this, uh, in this edition, clean energies continues to be a primar primary driver of job creation and uh, it will be so more and more in the future. The report also highlights an emerging challenge, the skill shortage, and suggests some policy interventions to relieve these bottlenecks. Enel, as a company on the front lines of the energy transition, continues to invest in strengthening competencies in our workforce from specialists in cutting edge clean technologies to technical roles in key areas of the transition. I'd like to highlight the most relevant topics on the, to a power utility like NL and where we are putting our efforts, uh, mainly in three areas. The first one is uh, promoting STEM and uh, vocational training. 
encouraging students to pursue STEM disciplines while also incentivizing vocational training is critical. Strengthening partnerships between educational institutions and energy industry will be essential to build a pipeline of skilled workers. The second uh, mm, uh, pillar is accelerating digital skills development. Uh, with the increasing dig digitalization of power grids, the industry is becoming more data-driven and reliant on advanced technologies. This means we need expertise in areas like data analysis, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. Leveraging transferable skills and related, uh, on, from related sectors is the third element. Reskilling workers from related fields is a cost-effective way to address skill shortages. A great example from the report is how roofers can upskill up as solar PV system designers with relative ease, benefiting from a quick return on the investment in training. I'd, like, I'd also like to emphasize one point beyond reskilling and upskilling as traditionally understood, which is the impact of innovation and digitalization on enabling non-linear non -linear, linear career paths. The report highlights any green powers reboost program where former thermal plant workers were trained as drone operators for renewable plants. Furthermore, innovative technologies and artificial intelligence are also enhancing workplace safety. A recent success story from Enegrids in our remote trimming project which uses a remotely controlled robot to trim vegetation near power lines. This keeps our operators safely out of high-risk areas. Before I close, I'd like to touch on a topic which is very relevant to our company and some others have already mentioned, uh, which uh, is the gender gap. We need to address the gender gap in the energy sector. In 2023, women made up less than 20% of the energy workforce, while they represent 39% of the, the, of the global workforce. However, the energy transition offers us a unique chance to bridge this gap, as some clean energy sectors are already showing higher representations of women, even in leadership roles. In summary, as we drive forward in the energy transition, it becomes crucial to continue focusing on strategic workforce development, gender diversity, and innovative training paths. With the right support, these efforts will not only help to close up the skills gaps, but also create a more dynamic and inclusive workforce for the future. So then, thanks for again for this opportunity to contribute to the conversation and to the report itself. Thank you very much, Elisabetta. Really fascinating the tour the horizon that you have done of what uh, uh, your company is doing on uh, uh, on training, upskilling. I was uh, fascinated by a few of the things you said, in particular the fact that some of the training upskilling can also uh, actually increase safety. Uh, and this, yeah, I think, uh, an excellent, excellent point. And thank you for uh, stressing again um, the need to continue to work towards uh, decreasing the uh, gender gender gap. Thank you again for being with us uh, um, today. Let me now turn to uh, Eric. So we have been talking about workers and finally we have the voice of workers. Thank you, Eric, for joining is, us from uh, Baku. Uh, I remind everyone that Eric is the Deputy Secretary General at the International Trade Union Confederation. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Corey. Um, uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of uh, ITUC, I would like to express our gratitude for the invitation and appreciation for the important work being done uh, by the uh, IEA. The ITUC appreciates strongly the increasing attention by the IEA to the social dimension of energy policies. Employment aspects are important to understand the challenge and opportunity uh, of the clean energy transition. As trade union representatives, we have heard time and time again that the net effects 
of the clean energy transition will be positive. More jobs in renewables will be created than will be lost in the fossil sectors. The old energy employment, the report of old energy employment confirmed this evolution. But while the net effect will probably be positive, it is of crucial importance for the transition to be successful to deal with the people that will lose their job. Winners usually take care of themselves. It's the losers that need to receive our attention. We appreciate the work of the IEA and the Global Commission of on people-centered clean energy transition to put the focus on these transition challenges. While we applaud strongly the creation of new jobs, there is more than just the numbers. As representative of the workers, we ask for good quality, decent jobs. This refers to occupational health and safety, consideration of fundamental labor rights. This is very relevant in the development of, for example, offshore wind projects. It also refers to wages, a central aspect of quality, jo quality jobs. We appreciate very much the focus of the report on the evolution of wages in the energy sector. Due to less widespread provision of collective bargaining, we see that renewable energy jobs have often low pay, lower pay than fossil jobs, fuel jobs. It is obvious that this does not contribute to a smooth transition. There is also an important link with the reported skills shortage. We cannot agree more with one of the observations of the report that higher wage should help ease some of the skills shortage cited by firms. Of course, this can lead to higher project costs, but then we are in the discussion on the sharing of cost and benefit of the transition. From our perspective, it's clear it should be not the workers that pay for the clean energy transition by having to accept low pay jobs. Finally, I would like to make the link with the climate negotiation going on here in Baku, Azerbaijan at this moment. Multilateral climate policy is in, deep, in a deep crisis for the moment. It is not delivering the emission reductions that are need to reach the Paris objectives. Investments have to be scaled up. Climate finance has to reach the trillions of public finance. We need a collective, a new collective quantified goal, NCQG, that ensure a fair and equitable transition that protects both human rights and workers' rights. With policies ensuring a future with fair wages, safe and healthy work condition. This is not just about sustaining jobs, but about creating new opportunity within an economy that respects our environment and the people within it. I would like just to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, not only for the great intervention just now, reminding us uh, how important are uh, good quality jobs. I would like to remind everyone that uh, um, the International Trade Union Confederation was indeed part, as you reminded, uh, of our Global Commission, and that the Global Commission actually uh, prepared some recommendations that were released at the G20 in Brazil. Um, I believe that these recommendations are really very valid and should be really looked at uh, and, and brought forward, and in particular the ones that you mentioned. Uh, on, on good, good quality uh, jobs yeah. and beyond. And, yeah, thank uh, you for letting me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Bye.
let me now turn to um, Ephraim Beiser. Also, he is uh, in COP, probably in a different room uh, than, uh, than Eric. Uh, and uh, Ephraim is a senior lead manager of public policy and economic graph at LinkedIn. And of course, LinkedIn has become over the past few years uh, the place where everyone goes to find a job, whether you are an employer or an employee. Uh, so, um, Efren, we are all looking forward to hearing your per your perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. I'm really glad to be here. Um, you know, I think uh, Eric, I can't wait to figure out what room you were in. It probably was a little quieter than the room I'm in. Um, so if you hear the background noise, that's the buzz of people getting to know one another, talking about how to find climate solutions. Um, I think being here in Baku, there's a clear, uh, the conversation around skills and jobs is very much very relevant. This is the first ever COP with a human development day focused in large part on skills. Um, they'll announce the Baku initiative on human development, which really focuses on skills and climate education, trying to figure out how we help build a workforce to deliver on all of the climate solutions we've talked about, namely tripling uh, renewable energy production globally and doubling energy efficiency. So this is very much um, part of the conversation here in Baku. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, is great about what we can do at LinkedIn is we can use all of the, the, the billion plus people who use, a link, who use LinkedIn to talk about trends in the labor market. And one way that we use those trends is to talk about how climate change is changing the world of work and how the world of work must change to deliver climate action. And so last week we released our 2024 green skills report. And when I look at the key findings in this report, there's a lot of similarities. And I think it just re serves to reinforce how powerful some of these trends are. So for one thing, what we can see on LinkedIn is that employer demand for workers with green skills, and this isn't specific to energy, this is, but generally is growing twice as fast as the, work for, as, uh, the workforce with those skills is growing. And so that is not the, the pattern we want to be on if we want to be able to fill and meet this demand from employers. And I would say that it's pretty safe to say, at least, that employer demand is a lagging indicator of planetary need when it comes to doing all this work, <laughs> which really means that the, the headline from that research is we have to double the amount of workers we train each year with green skills. <clears throat> I think the second thing, and I saw this in the, in the Energy Employment Outlook, is that competition for this talent is fierce and opportunities for these workers are great. And what I mean by that is we have a measure at LinkedIn called LinkedIn Hiring Rate. It looks at the economic churn of workers, so specifically how quickly workers find jobs. And we find that workers with green skills have a globally have a, a hiring rate that's 55% higher than the workforce overall. And that's driven by two things. One, which the report also gets at, that employers are hiring people who already do this work. And that may be a way in the short term fills an employer need, but it doesn't do the thing we need to do at scale, which is bring more people into the workforce to solve these problems and work on these challenges. And we have to find new ways to do that. And I think that uh, what Dan was describing around on the job training is one of the key ways that we de deploy skills-based practices, not only to bring to hire people, but to develop talent to be part of the solution. I also think some of the findings we see around the fastest growing skills are really illustrative of the role of the renewable growth of renewable energy. The fastest growing skills all over the world overwhelmingly fall into four categories. One is renewable energy production. Two is building decarbonization. Three is sustainable procurement, which includes buying, like putting in plans to buy renewable energy, which we know is a big part for a lot of companies. And lastly, ecosystem management. And when I looked at the data, my initial hypothesis was that ecosystem management referred to more about adaptation, but it actually also relates to having to manage all of the additional land you need to kind of provi uh, to provide all that renewable energy. If you think about how much land you need for solar and wind. And we see titles like arborist show up in our data because we need people who know how to work with nature so we can deploy these technologies and tools. I also would say that we see the renewable energy sector is growing in every country in our data. We did our research included 45 countries. And so it's just that continued growth. I want to, um, two points to end on one, uh, just a quick note on AI and energy. What we see is that in the tech industry, skills like sustainability and buying renewables show up as fast growing skills. And I think that's in part because there's a growing recognition that the tech industry is going to be increasingly resource intensive. And part of that has to think about how to deal with that change. 
And but we also see skill like software engineers having to learn how to manage and measure the energy required to process the code they write. And our next research agenda, the next thing we're gonna start doing some research on, I know there's a, a, a event coming up at IA about this, is what are the skills, the interplay of AI and energy skills and how do those play together so that you can actually leverage AI to deliver some of the, and accelerate and enable some of the renewable energy solutions we talk about. And I'll, I'll end with maybe just some, what we see and some recommendations that we have that I think align a lot with what IEA suggests. One is that we got to figure out how to get energy and climate agencies and those energy agencies in particular work with their labor and education counterparts. And research like this is what's going to be the foundation for those conversations. And similarly, when we're at places like Baku, as negotiators are figuring out what uh, their, their negotiations and as countries are going to be soon developing their next nationally determined contributions, how do we ensure that those contributions, those commitments include investing in skills development as a key enabler of delivering on that climate uh, ambition? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Efrem. I particularly like your uh, uh, your last point on uh, uh, on making use of uh, NDCs, for example, as one of the channels to really uh, bring this uh, interconnection between skilled labor and the energy transition uh, forward. Uh, I rebound on something you said. Uh, we are indeed working uh, on uh, a major conference on energy and AI that we will be hosting here uh, on the 5th of December. The opening will be uh, live streamed and um, uh, we look forward to welcoming ed again uh, LinkedIn uh, on that occasion. So uh, thank you, Efrem, um, and again to you as well. Uh, good luck, uh, good luck, good luck at COP. So uh, with this, um, I would say that uh, uh, I would like to thank once again uh, Dan Wetzel for uh, for the presentation and all of our speakers that joined us from uh, uh, from around the world. Um, I would say that there is really. Um, this is really becoming front and center in uh, in all energy conversations, and certainly we at the IEA, we will continue uh, to do so either through the Global Commission, through our uh, people-centered transition work, and through this uh, uh, analytical um, uh, work as well. Um, I would like to say the following, that, that we have um, given you really the pills uh, of this report, the 10 minutes presentation, you can find it online, but the work has really been done by a fantastic team that I would like uh, to thank, they're sitting here with us in the room is uh, Kelly Andrews, uh, Rebecca Raff, and Michael McGovern. And I'm very pleased to say that um, uh, they have not only done all the hard work, uh, they will be available on the 21st of November next week um, to give, uh, they will be giving a technical webinar to give you all the insights of uh, all what we have learned. Uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, several areas of recommendations that we touched upon today, but they will really uh, dwell into into those uh, uh, on 21st of November. So uh, I uh, give you, I conclude this, giving you an appointment to next week uh, on this very topic uh, again, and thanking uh, all of our speakers and all of you uh, listening again. Um, greetings from Paris. Thank you. <laughs>